Testing, one, two, three. This is a talk given on the 28th of February, 1989, at the Wisconsin Dells Public Library by Dr. William Drennan. It's part of the Sense of Place lecture series sponsored by the Wisconsin Arts uh, and Humanities Committee and also the Wisconsin Library Association. Campus, and uh, it's super to see everybody here. This is, uh, this is pleasant. What exactly we're going to do with Nero's book, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, we can find out together at least. Somebody said that uh, there tends to be recurring uh, attendance at these places, but I'm at the disadvantage of, uh, uh, while I know I see a lot of familiar faces, right, uh, of not knowing folks. So I will be so gauche as to suggest we kind of introduce ourselves and oh, that would be wonderful. And I feel a little more comfortable than maybe you would too. So maybe we could start over here. Well, who's she? I have no idea. <laughs> if you don't block the door, there's no telling. My name's Alan White, and I live in the Dallas. Happy Wendell. Alice Topol from the Dallas. John Frederick, Rural Baraboo. Maria Gamdaro, Rural Montella. Helene Vanderbilt with Melton. Eric Glendorf, Wisconsin Dells. And Bryce Davies from rural Wisconsin Dells. Kathy Scarborough, Wisconsin Dells. I'm Joe Folgers, and I live down in the woods in Wisconsin Dells. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Jen Foss, and I'm from the Dells. I'm Mary Goles, and I'm from the Dells. I'm out of Hawaii, and I live eight miles north on Highway 13, up in the corner of Del Prairie Township. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I'm Charlotte Walsh Davies, and I'm a librarian here. <laughs> Thanks for starting starting us out. Just wanted to remind you all that this is the fourth in our series of discussions based on the theme of sense of place. Started out the discussion with the pamphlet, A Sense of Place. Um, and after that, we had a discussion on... Um, Stan County Almanac, written by Aldo Leopold, and we had um, his daughter. I don't know, have you I've, met Nina I've talked with her on the phone um, relative to another Let's Talk About a program at a library, and I can't remember the name of the town, hmm. but they were uh, trying to work something up, and would I give her a call, and I did. Yeah. yeah it was pleasant. Oh, she's, she was wonderful, and she brought slides and um, showed some kind of before and after things was really neat. So each one of our discussions have been a little bit different. And then last um, time with David Cole, we talked about Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, frontier historian, and uh, he's from the Portage area. And now tonight we're going to be talking about John Muir from, uh, also he, well, he calls it rural Portage, and I call it rural Montello. I think of it as <laughs> more Marquette. Yeah, yeah. Marquette yeah. yeah. And then next month, on the, um, it's the last Tuesday in March, I think it's the 28th, thank you it is, we will be um, having discussion on the ghost of Blackhawks Island, and I do have cop your copies of that tonight to pass out, and uh, if you know of people who are missing tonight, uh, and you see them in the next couple weeks at the grocery store or church or wherever, mention to them that we do have our copies in, and I'll give those out to you tonight so you can get reading. Uh, and that discussion will be with the scholar um, Bill, Van Bill Dyke, I was going to say Dan Dyke, Bill Dyke, um, who is the former mayor of Madison. He's living now in the Mineral Point area, he's a lawyer there, and uh, he is also the head of the Durlitz Society in Wisconsin and has a real knowledge on um, of Durlitz, so um, that should be very interesting too, and we hope that you can all make it for that one. And, but I'm excited to hear what Bill has to say Me tonight. Me too. Me <laughs> <laughs> too. said they've all been different. This will be different her than most. I guess. Uh, since I started talking to you about John Muir, who I, I confess uh, I was not familiar with, uh, I've been compiling a fairly hefty file here. There's certainly lots of stuff about Muir in the air these days. 
the current issue of Wisconsin Academy Review, for some reason, which is, for some reason, the December 88 issue, uh, but the most recent one, is uh, pretty well devoted to Muir. I don't know if it's mm. a publication that you that you see often, but uh, um, the uh, first article, for example, is uh, Restoring the Fountain of John Muir's Youth, and they're talking about Fountain Lake, that lake that's mm. referred to so often on the Wisconsin farm, and his uh, uh, juvenile biography. There's a picture of him as a young man. We always see him, or most of the pictures I've seen, you know, a rather more mature fellow. Um, and uh, a sketch of the Fountain Lake farmhouse. I think this is pretty much replicated in the book that we have. Um, here's uh, the uh, acreage for the Muir Memorial Park was dedicated in 1957, and his granddaughter was there speaking and so on. Um, there's a United Presbyterian Church erected in 1865 between the two farms that John Muir's father built there, and that, there's that. We should, maybe we should all pile into our cars and go look at this thing. We're not going that far away. Um, uh, and then there's a, an article on Ralph Waldo Emerson coming to Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, and meeting uh, Muir. This was a kind of epical meeting of two giants, actually. Uh, 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 Emerson was nearing the end of his career and Muir just beginning his, but they seemed to recognize themselves as sort of kindred spirits. Articles in here about the, uh, the women who were important in Muir's life in terms of getting him into the state university uh, at the time, as it was called. And uh, here's Muir, still looks like maybe just before middle aged, handsome fellow. Um, and I've been seeing lots of stuff. All, all of, I've, Notice in the card catalog here, there's some seven separate volumes by Muir, uh, doubtless many others uh, about him. I compiled a kind of very brief bibliography. I had no idea how many folks would be here tonight. This we have be, a photo copy. This should be pretty close. If uh, maybe when we're done, we can make extra copies for people who need them. Uh, this is not necessarily recommended reading at all. It's just some text that I came across in. Uh, uh, in footnotes and other bibliographies and uh, and so on while uh, while looking a little bit into Muir. Several texts here you can see are by him, uh, others about him. Uh, the standard biography seems to be one by a woman named Wolf, and I see that that's available here as well. I don't think that... Yes, here, the, the uh, John Muir of the Mountains uh, came out in 1915, probably time for a a newer and perhaps fuller treatment of newer. Um, and here it is, we got? Yeah. Oh, oh. That's the one by Wolf. Yes, son of the, oh, okay. Well, she's written another one called John Muir of the Mountains. Mm -hmm. And so okay. uh, she must have done a good deal of, uh, of biographical stuff on him. Um, I think in, in some ways, um, it is maybe less than felicitous to have a, um, an English professor talk about this book. And the, the, the reason I say that is be, before we uh, uh, congregated here tonight, uh, uh, I know Aldith came up and, and perhaps some others and said, well, what's this bird he refers to on page 34 and what's this fish? I, I have no idea. You know, I think uh, maybe some real advantage would accrue to having some uh, naturalist or, or a botanist or a zoologist uh, handle uh, this text rather than a literature person. Uh, my own background is uh, my doctorate is in Renaissance English and um, uh, trying to find some points of contact between that training and, and this text <coughs> was sometimes challenging. Um, um, but I, I almost have to look at every text I read, whether it's uh, autobiographical as this one is, or fictional, uh, non-fiction, what have you, as, as if it were, I guess, a literary text. I do that, uh, uh, that, that's sort of my bent. And one thought that occurred to me while reading Muir's uh, biography of his childhood and youth was, uh, was this thought and it's hardly earth-shattering, but the thought was this. Um, gee, lots of times we wish the world were different than it is. Uh, I think that's true. I, I feel fairly secure in saying there are times in our life when we look around and say, 
that life somehow doesn't live up to our expectations for it, or at least our desires for it. You know, you, you nurse these uh, hidden wants, needs, desires, and there's no way that they're going to be met in the real world which you inhabit. And this forces us, does it not, to posit other worlds in which those needs might be gratified, in which worlds in which we could be happy. Uh, worlds which would be more responsive, perhaps, to our needs, desires, ambitions, dreams, drives, and so on. It occurred to me that there are perhaps two basic ways we look at that alternative world. That is, we're in our real life, the life filled with mortgages and kids with the flu and, and uh, uh, shoveling sidewalks and bosses and things. And we say, gee, life should be better than this. Um, and it seems to me when we say that, when we say, gee, life should be better than this, we're imagining some other kind of life. And it seems to me we have two choices when we do that. We can either envision this alternative cosmos, this other universe, this other world, as an Eden or as a utopia seems to me those are the two alternatives open to us. And Eden is something that we... I'll pass out a sheet here a moment on some thoughts that occurred to me at the word processor when this idea occurred to me. Eden is something we look back on. Uh, for many of us, I guess, as with Muir, it would be something associated with our childhood. And we have an idea, don't we, what, what we mean by Eden. We'll be talking more about Eden tonight, and we'll be talking more about utopia. And, and maybe uh, getting closer to a definition of what we mean by those terms. And your assistance in that ongoing procedure would be most welcome, because things are still a little foggy and inchoate up here. But certainly Eden is something that we look back on and is often associated with our youth, I think. For, for myself, I have no, I, no doubt at all what my Eden was. And my, my Eden was going to the Jersey Shore when I was a kid, from the time I was born till I hit adolescence. And I spent every summer of that time at my grandmother's place on a little island off the coast of New Jersey, six miles at sea, 16 miles long, half mile wide at its widest point. Uh, New Jersey has a bad reputation, much of it deserved, but there's parts of New Jersey perfectly wonderful. And this part, this was an enchanted place. It was a wonderful place. Uh, there were no parents. I didn't realize until I was uh, a young adult that it's not common for parents to, to foist off their children in the summertime, but, but uh, uh, it seemed perfectly natural to me. Uh, there was an incredibly indulgent grandmother uh, with a house on the beach. You slept in your bathing suit and woke up in it and got some uh, uh, jets. I was just thinking that that was the cereal I ate as kids. No longer exists. I would give anything to find some jets. <laughs> and then you just go off. And the big decision every day was: Do you go to the Do you go to the ocean side of the island, or do you go to the bay side of the island? Of the bay? That was the big decision. And there was no crime. There were there were no problems. You could walk the length of the island of a day if you wanted to. Or maybe Frankie Cranmer's dad would take you into Connie Mack Stadium to see the Phillies. Every day was just filled with wonderful adventures, and it was so good. I mean, television was new, and situated where the island was, you could get both the New York and the Philadelphia stations. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And uh, it, it was so good that you, that you knew even as a kid it was good. I mean, sometimes things are good to us in retrospect. We say, oh, gee, that wasn't that wonderful, and not realizing it at all at the time. But it, this place was so transcendently wonderful that you realized even when you were a kid, you say, geez, this is great. This is, hey, life's all right, you know, thinking that that's going to last a long time. Oh, and of course it does. You know, grandmothers die and you grow old and people move away and the island becomes overpopulated and pretty soon it's gone. But that, that's, that really is Eden. Sometimes when the wind is just right, even in relatively landlocked Wisconsin, you'll get a breath of something that approximates salt air and I am back there. You know, mm. Just transport us. God. I think I'm generally an Eden kind of person. That is... When I'm positing a life different from the one I'm in, uh, I tend to think back to that childhood experience and say, God, that was wonderful. That was terrific. There are lots of other people, I think, doubtless people here, who are more utopian thinkers. That is, people who see 
the better life as something existing out in the future and which you strive for, which you hope to attain through work, something that you hope to earn in a sense. Nobody earns eating. You're born into it and you can be thrown out but but and you almost have to be expelled, I think, finally if you're to grow as a person at all. But uh, uh, utopia is something that can be achieved, I think, sometimes, remembering always that the original meaning of utopia in Greek is nowhere. But we like to think maybe. Maybe if we work hard enough and we keep our vision straight enough that maybe we can, within our individual lives or in, as, in our history as a race, achieve some situation which we will think of as an infinitely better world than the one that we inhabit uh, now. I want, this may seem quite tangential to, to the book that we are talking about tonight, but I want to suggest in a very general way, and there's lots of contradictions, but I want to say, in a very general way, it strikes me that Muir's childhood in Scotland is primarily an Edenic experience. And that when he comes to Wisconsin as a young boy, uh, true to his grandfather's prediction back in Scotland, uh, Wisconsin comes for him, the new world comes for him, uh, to be a place where one sets out on the road after a certain amount of training and an infinite amount of work on a sort of moral quest for what we might call a utopia. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Muir had some utopian notions in mind, it seems to me, when he became one of the co-founders of the Sierra Club um, and uh, began to establish his reputation as, uh, as uh, perhaps the country's most predominant naturalist. That's the grand design. That's the program. We'll see if it flies. I don't know. Let me uh, <laughs> let me share with you some uh, uh, characteristics that occurred to me of these uh, two senses of place, as I uh, entitle this handout. I'll wait till most of you at least have your hands on this. Here's another book, by the way, I came across uh, um, principally about Muir. It's a collection of his writings edited by Lisa Maggetto, Maggetto, Muir Among the Animals, the wildlife writings of John Muir. There's some wonderful pieces in here um, that uh, those of you who are, have some interest now in, in Muir, I think you'll find, including uh, some absolutely hair-raising adventures that you Alaska. It's astonishing. Mm -hmm. it's a book worth looking at. Okay, I, I, I've stipulated here some characteristics of, of these two visions, it seems to me. One of Eden and um, um, the other of Utopia. Um, these are meant to kind of play off against each other. Eden, for example, Arcadia in, in mythic terms, I guess, perhaps in the uh, um, uh, strictly Western secular tradition is a place of primal innocence. Uh, William Blake, for example, the great, very early 19th century uh, uh, romantic poet, British poet, uh, wrote two collections of poems. One he called <coughs> Songs of Innocence and the other Songs of Experience. He was uh, playing off on this same notion, I think, of, of the Eden life and then the life outside of Eden. And the Songs of Innocence are Edenic songs. They're the songs of childhood, the songs of primal innocence, poems like uh, uh, Little Lamb, Who Made Thee, Dost Thou Know, Who Made Thee, just lovely lilting uh, stuff that you can read to your children. And suddenly you turn to the songs of experience and things are much darker. Um, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what a mortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry. And it's scary. There's no tigers in, in, in Eden. Uh, outside of Eden, there's tigers. The lamb may lie down with the lion, but you've got to keep throwing in lambs in order to keep that situation. <laughs> uh, uh, Utopia or the New Jerusalem, the Civitas Dei, perhaps, of Revelation, uh, is a place of uh, earned experience. Not necessarily guilt, not the opposite of innocence, not corruptness necessarily, uh, not even sin, perhaps, in the most common understanding of that word, but experience. 
experience with evil, uh, even if the person himself doesn't partake deeply of it. Uh, you can't enter Eden, you can only be born there, but you can be kicked out, as we said. Uh, Utopia, on the other hand, uh, is a place you can only enter. Uh, lots of folks are left out, and that seems to be a necessity. A, a, a utopia is an inclusive kind of place which exists by letting other people know they can't get in. But once you get in, nobody leaves. Uh, uh, third, the Edenic dream, Edenic, of course, is just the adjectival form of Eden, is, is backward-looking. Eden is a past world, New Jersey, in which the contradictions and complications of the present world have not yet arisen. All of us who have had kids, I think, are familiar with the warnings that come instantly to a parent's life. Wait till you get out in life. You'll see what it's like. John Muir's father did that to him. Didn't he? Wait till you get out there. You think I've been tough. Hey, I haven't been tough. The world's tough. <laughs> Muir, interestingly enough, found that not true. He found, once he got away from his father, he found people universally kind. <laughs> Instructive, perhaps, those of us who are, are struggling at parenting. Uh, the utopian dream, on the other hand, is forward-looking. Utopia is a future world in which the contradictions and complications of the present world have been resolved, finally, at last taken care of. Uh, fourth, Eden dwellers get to do whatever they want. Adam and Eve had utter autonomy, <coughs> almost. Their motto is, do what thou wilt, is here the law. Neither work nor knowledge is necessary or even desirable. There's no sense of knowing a lot about horticulture, for example, if you live in a garden and it's there. It's already there. Already there. No need for labor. No need for ambition. Um, utopian dwellers or utopian dreamers, on the other hand, uh, do what they ought to do. Certainly Muir's father was very much into doing what one ought to do. Their motto is, in his will is our peace. Work and knowledge are requisites for achieving the utopian dream. Hence... At the end of this book, we find Muir at the State University of Madison that is ready for his life, or what remains of it. Fifth, although aggression can exist in Eden, aggressive fantasies do not predominate. Ambition is unknown. There's no sense of being ambitious if you're in Eden. You've already got it as good as it gets. You know, like the uh, old Milwaukee act. You know, Geez, guys, this is as good as it gets. And there's no sense of having ambitions beyond that. Um, uh, for utopians, on the other hand, aggressive fantasies predominate. If, 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 if a utopia is something to achieve, if that better life, that better world you want is something to achieve, then you better be about achieving it. And that calls for some aggress aggression, I guess, some work, some planning, some programs. Uh, the actions by which it can be realized uh, ought to be undertaken. And finally, in Eden, it seemed to me that play, the, the, the Latin term homo ludens, man at play, seems appropriate there, predominates over work. There's no call for ambition or any sort of program. Conversely, in, uh, in a utopia, or on the road to a utopia, perhaps, work predominates over play. Programs are formulated to achieve desired ends, and ambition and labor are prized and rewarded. Again, with, with many exceptions, since we're dealing with life here, not with fiction, I would have tidied this book up a little bit if I were making a novel out of it. Um, I, I think we can see some, uh, um, uh, some sense of this design in, in Muir's book, and, and uh, I hope most of us have copies of it. And let's, let's, let's turn to the text itself, which is um, uh, what I tend to do when talking about books. Um, we can skip the introduction, although it has some interesting things to say along those lines, I think, or suggestive of that. Uh, page three is where the text begins, and he's describing the Scotland that, that he grew up in. Uh, and he says uh, around the second sentence, Fortunately, around my native town of Dunbar, by the stormy North Sea, there was no lack of wildness, though most of the land lay in smooth cultivation. Um, it seems to me there's a lot of tension in this book between uh, uh, Muir the farmer and Muir the conservationist. You know, sometimes these two ideas meld uh, very well. Sometimes it seems to me they might be in conflict. We know from the introduction, for example, that John Muir came to write this book only because he was befriended by a Northwestern industrialist, the man credited with bringing the Colorado River under control. It struck me that 
It's a rather odd mentor for, for Muir, this man who has obviously seen nature as an obstacle, as an enemy to be overcome, kind of putting under his wing this man who, who has an almost holy respect for some aspects of nature. Um, uh, a man who, John Muir, who throughout his life promoted such things as wilderness preservation, forest preservation, uh, the establishment of national parks, yet who spent a good deal of his youth cutting down trees uh, in order to make some fields that you could get. Um, I'm not sure Muir is always aware of the irony there, but I think we as readers are. There's a certain tension between what we need out of nature and and what we respect out of nature, it seems to me. On page uh, 26, um, we learn a little bit about his schooling there in, in Scotland, which makes all of us perhaps feel a little uneasy about our own educational background. They seem to be doing a pretty good job there. Um, Oh, uh, two-thirds of the way down that page. In the first few Latin and French lessons, a new teacher, Mr. Lyon, blandly smiled at our comical blunders, but pedagogical weather of the severest kind quickly sent in. And, and they set to work on Latin and French and English and, and spelling history, arithmetic, geography. Muir memorizes the respective grammars of those three languages. Um, uh, um, and then he goes home and his father has him memorize the Bible. I could recite the New Testament from the beginning of Matthew to the end of Revelation without a single stop. He says toward the end of 27, I can't conceive of anything that would now enable me to concentrate my attention more fully than when I was a mere stripling boy and it was all done by whipping, thrashing in general. We keep getting this kind of Old Testament father, don't we? Who's who's, uh, um, uh, yeah, 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 that's very much his philosophy. Old-fashioned Scotch <laughs> teachers spent no time in seeking short roads to knowledge or in trying any of the newfangled psychological methods. If we failed in any part, however slight, we were whipped. So even in Eden, I guess, we've, we've, we've got the snake in the garden here. Uh, um, often associated, it seems to me, with his father. Uh, we know from other sources, for example, that one of Muir's brothers and one of his sisters objected to the early drafts of this book, which were apparently were even harder on the father figure than, than what we have. Uh, Muir toned things down a bit. One of his brothers did support him, however, in seeing the father as a, well, close to abusive and often cruel. Um, Still in Muir, even uh, in the midst of this punishment, is this love for nature, page 37, about a third of the way down. Nevertheless, like devout martyrs of wildness, a term that appears often in this text, we stole away to the seashore of the green, sunny fields with almost religious regularity. Again, that connection between religion and nature. Taking advantage of opportunities when Father was busy, to join our companions, often as to hear the birds sing and hunt their nests, glorying in the number we had discovered and call our own. And they they have a little contest among themselves as to who can find the most birds. This is out of the reach of the father, and it seems to me when he gets away from the father uh, that what we get here is a very much an Eden. Uh, uh, boys together being boys, uh, but loving nature very much and feeling an active uh, sympathy with nature. Uh, page 38, uh, two-thirds of the way down, no Scotch boy that I knew of ever failed to listen with enthusiasm to the songs of the skylarks. Uh, oftentimes on a broad meadow near Dunbar, we stood for hours enjoying their marvelous singing and soaring. Very Edenic vision, it seems to me. Uh, the most delicious melody, sweet and clear and strong, overflowing all bounds, and suddenly he would soar higher again and again, ever higher and higher, soaring and singing until lost to sight even on perfectly clear days, and oftentimes in cloudy weather far in the downy cloud, as the poet said. Um, toward the bottom of that page, 39, it was far too common a practice among us to carry off a young lark just before it could fly and place it in a cage. That doesn't work. And he learns respect for, for uh, uh, wildlife by trying to tame that which will not be tamed. Halfway down page 40, at last, conscience-stricken, we carried the beloved prisoner to the meadow west of Dunbar where it was mm. born and blessing its sweet heart, bravely set it free and our exceeding great reward was to see it fly and sing in the sky. And they had running matches and 
absolute marathons that go on forever. Uh, again, sheer joy. Um, um, not a lot of complications in this life once you get away from the schoolhouse, once you get away from the father. Um, uh, feelings of, of great liberty, of great personal satisfaction. Toward the bottom of page 41. Wildness, there's that word again. Wildness was ever sounding in our ears and nature saw to it that besides school lessons and church lessons, some of her own lessons should be learned perhaps with a view to the time when we should be called to wander in wildness to our heart's content. Oh, the blessed enchantment of those Saturday runaways in the prime of the spring. How our young wandering eyes reveled in the sunny, breezy glory of the hills and the sky, every particle of us thrilling and tingling with the bees and glad birds and glad streams. Kings may be blessed. We were glorious. We were free. School cares and scoldings, heart thrashings and le flesh thrashings alike were forgotten in the fullness of nature's glad wildness, which I suggest to you is easy. These were my first excursions, the beginnings of lifelong wanderings. He's talking here about a wildness, but back on page three we remember this wildness was described as smooth cultivation. There's nature and there's nature. There's a formal English garden and there's a um, rural Montello. I mean, these are two different experiences. Okay. Um, it struck me that there's a real parallel between what Muir is talking about here and a, a very well-known poem by his uh, kind of geographic neighbor, uh, Dylan Thomas, the Welsh poet, who, uh, who was born the year that, uh, that Muir died, 1914. It's what Thomas is talking about in this poem. This is a poem about his childhood in Wales, just as Muir is talking about his childhood here in uh, in Scotland. And, it, and, and, and in both places, I think, we have here traced this movement from initial innocence, this almost uh, romantic with a capital R uh, experience with nature, much as what you would find in the poetry of Wordsworth or Shelley or Byron or Keats, or Coleridge, um, and what happens later, the world of experience. We're not going to read this whole thing, but just some passages, uh, starting with that first stanza, talking again about the childhood experience with nature. Now as I was young and easy under the apple boughs about the lilting house, and happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry time let me hail <coughs> and climb golden in the heydays of his eyes, and honored among wagons, I was prince of the apple towns. And once below a time, I lordly had the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall life. This gorgeous stuff. Uh, but uh, Thomas, again, saying the same thing we were saying at the end of that chapter. God, we were free. We were at absolute liberty. All of our needs were being met. This was uh, uh, the absolute exercise of the imperial self. Everything was well. A few stanzas down. Uh, all the day long it was running. It was lovely. Again, running. The same imagery that Muir uses. Next stanza. And then to awake. And the farm like a wanderer white with the dew come back. The cock on his shoulder. And now we get explicitly Edenic. It was all shining. It was Adam and Maiden. The sky gathered again. And the sun grew round that very day. So it must have been after the birth of the simple light in the first spinning place. And we're back to Eden. But then we all catch adolescence somewhere down the road, don't we? And, and we get forced out of this Edenic experience. He says, uh, halfway down that next to the last stanza, My wishes raced through the house high hay and nothing I cared at my sky blue trades that time allows in all his tuneful turning so few and such morning songs before the children, green and golden, follow him out of grace, out of Eden, out of innocence, and into the world of experience which we all have to slug it out in. Nothing I cared in the lamb white days that time would take me up to the swallow thronged loft by the shadow of my hand in the moon that is always rising, time always going to rise nor that riding to sleep I should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. 
Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying. Though I sang in my chains like the sea. And this, I think, is the situation this... None of us want to do it. it, it you know, it, it's no... It's, uh, it's no surprise that we're all born crying. You know, we, we hate leaving Eden. Everything is fine. Uh, but the time comes when we are forced out. And that happens here. Uh, chapter 2 is called A New World. And we think of um, Shakespeare's Tempest. Oh, brave new world. Uh, Miranda, who says that line, uh, goes on to say that has such creatures in it, and the creatures that we see around them are awful people, uh, which uh, gives us some pause, perhaps. Uh, here, I think, is where we see this movement from Eden to the utopian vision. Uh, let's go on over to page uh, uh, 44. Um, it says about halfway down, reading in his, uh, still in Scotland, reading in his grammar book, about um, about the passenger pigeon in America. And he says, 50 or 100 nests on a single tree, the overloaded branches bending low and often breaking with the sheer weight of these birds. The farmers gathering from far and near, beating down countless thousands of the young and old birds from their nest and roosts with long poles at night and in the morning driving their bands of hogs, some of them brought from farms 100 miles distance to fatten on the dead and wounded covering the ground. But notice the reaction of the kid to this. The kid's still in Eden, okay? And he reads this, and all he is is interested. Gee, isn't this interesting? In America, across the sea, there's this passenger pigeon, and there's so many of them, the farmers come and eat the dead pigeons off the ground for forage for the, for the pigs. But notice, maybe with a finger there on page 44, skip on over to page 68. And he makes mention now, from the perspective of an adult, of the same incident. He's talking about... Uh, about his dog, Watch, who was killed for stealing chickens. And he says, halfway down page 68, So poor Watch was killed simply because his taste for chickens was too much like our own. Think of the millions of squabs that preaching, praying men and women kill and eat with all sorts of other animals, great and small, young and old. He's very much on his, uh, giving us a sermon here uh, on his at his pulpit. While eloquently discoursing on the coming of the blessed, peaceful, bloodless millennium, Think of the passenger pigeons that 50 or 60 years ago filled the wood and sky over half the continent, now exterminated by beating down the young from the nest together with their brooding parents before they could try their wonderful wings by clapping them in nets, feeding them to hogs, and so on. Now he's upset. You know, now he's mad. Now he's indignant. Now he sees this as a great moral problem. And he goes on to say, uh, gee, the nicest thing about this world was that it was around for a million of years before man ever arrived. Uh, here his longing for Eden seems to even all of us be pre-Edenic. Gee, the perfect world for me would be a life before man. Of course, that would obliterate himself, so there are problems there. But you see the two different kind of reactions. The Eden reaction to that body of material, to the fact of the passion for pigeon, and the kind of utopian. Gee, life's awful, let's change it. Here, gee, isn't life interesting? Isn't it interesting that there is such a thing? All sorts of struggle and travail um, becomes associated with this utopian vision. Uh, they go to say goodbye toward the bottom of page 45 to their grandfather. Uh, poor, lonely grandfather, about to be forsaken, looked with downcast eyes on the floor and said in a low, trembling, troubled voice, troubled voice, Ah, poor laddies, poor laddies, you'll find something else or the sea for buy gold and sugar, bird's nest and freedom for lessons and schools. You'll find plenty hard, hard work. Of course, work very much tied into the utopian vision. The utopia is something to achieve. Uh, so here, on page 45 and following, we see Eden deserted. Next morning, page 46, we went by rail to Glasgow and thence joyfully sailed away from beloved Scotland. And off they go. They're on the water for six weeks and three days, <coughs> which would be what, 45 days? Fire. If this were a novel, it would be 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah. That would be the perfect passage, I guess. Over on page uh, 49, uh, uh, they decide to come specifically to Wisconsin, uh, where the land was as good as in Canada, and more easily brought under cultivation. 
trees chopped down, land cleared, land tamed in some way. Again, that tension between nature and the raw and nature controlled in some way. They build a hut there at the bottom of page 51. It looks like, gee, they've just gone from one Eden to another, that Eden has somehow been reclaimed, to this charming hut in the sunny woods overlooking a flowery glacier meadow and a lake rim with white water, water lilies. We were hauled by an ox stream across trackless carrot swamps and low rolling hills sparsely dotted with round-headed oaks. And it seems that this is not only just an Eden again, that they've gone from the Eden of Scotland to the Eden of Wisconsin, but that it's a better Eden. The last paragraph on that page. This sudden plash into pure wildness, unlike, I suppose, the smooth cultivation of Scotland. Uh, baptism in nature's warm heart. How utterly happy it made us. Uh, he contradicts him sometimes. Sometimes that is. Other times he doesn't see nature as particularly warm-hearted, but here he does. Nature streaming into us, wooingly teaching us her wonderful, glowing lessons. So unlike the dismal grammar ashes and cinders so long thrashed into us. Oh, that, over the next page, that glorious Wisconsin wilderness. Flag waving here. Everything new and pure in the very prime of the spring. And again, these terms are very idenic. Uh, and it seems for a time that, that that's maybe what uh, uh, Wisconsin's going to be. Page 58, he mentions all sorts of bird types. I don't see any more. But then he goes on to describe Fountain Lake and the fireflies on the lake, the most wonderful thing he says he's ever seen. Um, uh, partridges drumming and uh, the lightning bugs throbbing with light. We seem, for a moment at least, to have um, a new Eden. Page uh, 63, very top of the page. But those first days and weeks of unmixed enjoyment and freedom, reveling in the wonderful wildness about us, were soon to be mingled with the hard work of making a farm. And it seems to me here we make the switch, maybe from from the utopian, from the Edenic vision to the utopian. Achievement becomes important, becomes necessary, and it seems to me that there's not a great deal of innocence here. The first image we get, indeed, is one of fire. Those magnificent brush fires with great white hearts and red flames. The first big wild outdoor fires I've ever seen. The fire destroying here, of course, the agency of destruction. Destroying purposefully, notice. Um, destroying what? Destroying parts of that glorious Wisconsin wildness he was talking about back on page 53. Um, and of course his father's running around saying, see, that's what happens to little boys when they're bad. That fire is cold compared to it. <laughs> but those terrible fire lessons, he said, quickly faded away in the blithe wilderness air. But again, those, that sense of innocence perhaps is lost. Uh, uh, we get a kind of healthy, perhaps utopian sense of evil in here with Dad running around the fire talking about hellfire and damnation and brimstone. Um, uh, that story about Watch uh, on page uh, 68. And then over to page 73... Um, the last page of this uh, chapter, uh, he talks about uh, the human qualities of little pigs and the relationships of little pigs to their mom. Very touching uh, sequence, I thought. Um, um, he was a, a, at least an occasional vegetarian. Um, uh, and there's a lot of sympathy for animals, a lot of identification indeed, with animals, in book, and identification between our species and, and lower species, which is kind of uh, it seems to me to have foreseen some um, uh, trends that are going on in uh, in philosophy uh, right now. Uh, we have a philosophy professor on campus who talks a lot about trans-speciesism. Um, and uh, Muir seems to have been his head ahead of his time there. Page 89, if you would. Um, uh, he talks about knob, of course. You remember this? This is a central passage on page 89. She was the most faithful, intelligent, playful, affectionate, human-like horse I ever knew, and she won all her hearts. Of the many great adventure, uh, of the many advantages of farm life for boys, one of the greatest is the gaining of a real knowledge of animals as fellow mortals, not something just to be petted, spoiled, slaughtered, or enslaved. So that tendency in Muir seems to have been uh, from early on. Page 96. Notice that what is utopian for the uh, kind of Old Testament father there is sometimes, at least, Eden for the boys. 
that second paragraph on Sundays after or before chores and sermons and Bible lessons. We drifted about on the lake for hours, especially in lily time, getting finest lessons and sermons from the water and flowers, ducks, fishes, and muskrats. In particular, we took Christ's advice and devoutly considered the lilies. And uh, page 103 has a little adventure in those lilies, doesn't it? He almost drowned. Almost drowned. And if I were making this into a novel, I would keep this passage in here. I like this because uh, again and again in, in myth and in literature based on myth, uh, sometimes in literature not consciously based on myth, we have this kind of baptismal scene. Uh, water, of course, is the element of baptism. It is the element of inarticulation. That is to say, we are air breathers. We're not meant to breathe water. We can't do it. If we did, we would die. And so baptism commonly from ancient times, indeed pre-Christian times, has to do with being inundated by this foreign element and then coming out of it, we suppose, in a mythical sense at least, someone different than we were when we went in. And this near drowning of Muir on this, in this um, a farm lake seems to be a kind of baptismal experience for him because after this the, the book becomes, it seems to me, decidedly more utopian than it had been before. He talks a lot, for example, about the cruelty of nature, page 109. He talks about all the animals he finds dead. You know, this is this wonderful nature, this warm-hearted nature who is uh, ready to give us moral instruction. But what about this, about six lines down? I remember a particularly severe Wisconsin winter when the temperature was many degrees below zero and the snow was deep, preventing the quail, which feed on the ground, from getting anything like enough of food. As was pitifully shown by a flock I found on our farm, frozen solid in a thicket of oak spines. They were in a circle about a foot wide, with their heads outward, packed close together for warmth, yet all had died without a struggle. One mild spring morning I picked up more than a score out of the grass and flowers, most of them daring singers that had perished in a sudden storm of sleety rain and hail. The cruelty of nature here, not the cruelty of nature, not of man. And this is the kind of person who can bring about a better world uh, for everyone. When I told Father that I was about to leave home, chapter 8, and inquired whether if I should happen to be in need of money he would send me a little, he said no. Hmm. Quite characteristic. Depend entirely on yourself. Good advice, I suppose, but surely needlessly severe for a bashful, home-loving boy who had worked so hard. And he has worked hard. He sets off with about $15 in his pocket on the road of his life. Uh, out of Eden now. Out of the Eden of Scotland. Out of this quasi-Eden of, of that farm in Marquette County. And he's on the road now to adulthood, to manhood, to maturity, to achieving great things in this world. Immediately he finds all sorts of helpers. I found, top of page 210, no lack of kindness and sympathy among other people, as we were talking uh, just before we started. Uh, the conductor on the train, the ticket taker, the, uh, the, the professor at the fair, the Partyville citizens. Uh, he's bringing with him, interestingly enough, some machines a clock and uh, a thermometer, I think, or a couple of clocks. It says, I've got these machines for keeping time and getting up in the morning and so forth. Of course, in Eden, you don't have to do any of those things. You don't need clocks in Eden. You don't need to get up in the morning. You certainly don't need a thermometer. Everything's always perfect. But, but he realizes now that life isn't Eden, is it? That Eden, insofar as we achieve it at all in this life, is something which we have to leave. Um, He's fascinated by machinery, a distinctly non-Edenic sort of thing. That is, um, steam locomotives do not exist in nature. Uh, he's interested in nature, yes, but he's interested in, in how things work, too. On page 213, he gets to ride on the train from uh, Partyville to, to Madison, uh, wanting to know how it goes. Um, He's entranced by this machine. Halfway down page 214, I went out and walked along the footboard on the side of the boiler, watching the magnificent machine rushing through the landscapes as if glorifying in its strength like a living creature. But of course, it's not a living creature. It's not natural in any way. It's the first time I'd ever been on a train. And many things are going to be the first time for him. Um, uh, he receives lots of praise for his machines on page 216. He's been so conditioned by his father not to accept praise uh, that he turns his head and, and blushes. Uh, he meets a professor of English literature at the University of Wisconsin. Must be a wonderful fellow who was, <laughs> who was, uh, who was helpful to him. 
And for a while he takes a job in Prairie du Chien, page 217, but that doesn't work out. And he realizes he's, he's, he's got, he, he can't go, keep going from Eden to Eden. He's got to strike out on his own. I was desperately hungry, he says, at the bottom of, uh, well, let's go up the halfway down, page 218. I was thus winning my bread while hoping that something would turn up that might enable me to make enough money to enter the State University. That was my ambition. It never wavered no matter what I was doing. End of that page. I was desperately hungry and thirsty for knowledge and willing to endure anything to get it. And he goes and he talks to Professor Sterling, the dean of the faculty, who says, sure, come on. University of Wisconsin had just been founded this, about the same year that Muir arrived in Wisconsin. It's a brand new place. The bottom of page 219. After hearing my story, the kind professor welcomed me to the glorious university. Next, it seemed to me, to the kingdom of heaven, the new Jerusalem. Uh, the Bible says we start out in Eden and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful place, an absolutely blessed place to be. And then we sin, we fall. Why do we fall? Well, according to one interpretation at least, we want to eat of the fruit of the knowledge. Hence, university of the Eden. Medieval fathers say this is a fortunate fall, however. Felix culpa, they call it in Latin. The fortunate fall because although it's terrible, Although now we must earn our daily bed by the sweat of our brow, and although childbirth is painful, and although death stalks us, and horrors, and accidents, and, and famine, and war, and all of the uh, um, uh, various pestilences, nonetheless, if we keep slugging it out, if we keep um, fighting the good fight and staying the course, one day we may achieve, at the end of Revelation, the city of God. So we move from the country, the Garden of Eden, to the urban, the city of God, from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning of the Bible to the end, and we are meant to understand that the kingdom of God, the Civitas Dei, the city of God, the New Jerusalem, is even a better place than Eden was because of what we have been through to get there. That we have been tempered in the fire in some way, and that somehow that experience has made us better folk. Uh, that the inhabitants of the city of God are better people than Adam and Eve. Uh, so there's a sense in which all of this trash we have to get through, the mortgages and the impacted wisdom teeth and the recalcitrant uh, car engines and so on, uh, is, is, is good for us. It's worth it. You know. uh, that's what we're here for. And we're getting better. Uh, and the university to him seems, interestingly enough, likened to the kingdom, capital K, of, ca of heaven, uh, capital H. He says, the uh, first paragraph on page 220, During the four years that I was in the university, I earned enough in the harvest fields during the long summer vacations to carry me through the balance of each year, working very hard, cutting with a cradle four acres of wheat a day, helping to put it in the shop. This is back back in Marquette County. He would walk from Madison to save the train. This is a guy who knew something about work. Page 222, uh, I made the long, hard, sweaty days work still longer and harder by keeping up my study of plants. Grandfather's prediction coming true here is that Wisconsin is a place of labor. It's a place of striving uh, for everybody in this room, I expect. All of us have in some corner of our minds some place we want to get to in either our individual lives or for our families or for all of us together. And Muir is part of that now. Eden has been put behind him. And he's on the road to, uh, to Utopia. <coughs> Bottom of page 227. Although I was four years at the university, I did not take the regular course of studies, of course, but instead picked out what I thought would be most useful. Again, a very utopian sort of notion. What can I use to get where I want to be? Chemistry and math and physics and so on. Anyhow, I wandered away on a glorious botanical and geological excursion. This is the journey, the trip, um, toward the utopia, I suppose. That, that journey somewhere between uh, Genesis and Revelation, which has lasted nearly 50 years and is not yet completed. Uh, so we leave Muir here at the end of uh, his youth, uh, on the road with the rest of us, his journey toward the New Jerusalem. Uh, no longer an Eden dweller, I think, but a utopian visionary. I think that's all I have to say about the book, but I would certainly be happy to hear what you have to say. Save those thoughts, folks. Oh, okay. 
because our discussion leader doesn't have a whole lot of questions here. So, um, so save your thoughts. Have a cookie. Fill up your coffee cup. Bill said that he would stick with us in the oh, discussion, sure. which I think is wonderful. And uh, so we can talk more about what he's brought forth, and we can bring forth our own ideas on what we've read. Okay. We can discreetly make changes <laughs> later. Okay. <coughs> well, I'm going to apologize because I, um, I don't know, I, I don't feel much like a discussion leader, you know. I, I enjoy s these groups so much and hearing what everybody has to say that when I have to start the discussion, I get a little what, it's hard to embarrassed. Him too. Yeah, that's I true, that too. The, I thought that his discussion was, was really exceptional. And I, even though I didn't read the whole book, I really think that it was something oh, Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe I'll, could I open up with a comment? You bet. Uh, one of the things that we had talked about earlier, one of the portions of the book that I did read, was when the kids, well, we, the first chapter, and the kids were in school. I thought it was kind of interesting that the school master would go, because of the proximity of his lodging facility, would go out. The minute he'd go out, They'd go back to the, what do you want to call it, wilderness or mm -hmm. to um, yeah. uh, Eden because it was just pure bedlam. And I thought that scene was so entertaining because I remember when I was teaching, well, this would probably be one of the things that would happen. <laughs> Mr. White come to the office and all of a sudden, you know, the class is up for grabs and people are getting killed. And it seemed to me there was another point there, too, where they were taking thrashings for going out into the, they weren't supposed to go, and, and maybe, uh, does anyone else remember that? They were going out into the wilderness or going into, this was in his youth now, and they would the risk seashore. that to the seashore. They would risk the beatings. Yes. They didn't really yes. care. Yeah. The beatings meant nothing to them. They wanted to get out there and be free. And they had to be back before dark, too. They were subject right. to punishment. If they, if right, and he would get into time. bed, and if he got into bed with his mother's help before his father got a hold of him, he would be safe <laughs> So I thought that kind of related to your idea yeah, at first yeah. about... Uh, and then, of course, he becomes a teacher himself, north of Madison there, and makes the machine, it's late in the book, but he makes the machine that starts the pot-bellied stove in mm. the school building while he stays asleep. And mm. <laughs> Sulfuric <laughs> acid poured onto something that starts, you know, I thought when I taught country, when I read that, I thought if I had just had that when I taught country That's school. Right. <laughs> That's right. Luke Goldberg. Tom Sanders. Well, um, when Bill stopped, he asked if there were comments, and I kind of butted in and said, no, save your comments. Um, are there comments that you would like to make now to Bill, and, or about Bill, or about the reading, or... Of all the books, I have enjoyed this one the most. I felt very close to this man when I was reading it because I loved the outdoors and I loved the critters and the trees and everything. Mm -hmm. And in so many of the parts of the book, I felt like he was just a very simple soul. But then, as Bill said, you know, it got so complicated in some of the things he did. But I really, I really enjoyed this in who made me understand it a lot more than I get all by myself. Okay. Oh, well, mm -hmm. my pleasure. I, it, I, it's probably, uh, I might have just complicated things, because I think the book is pretty straightforward, pretty direct, you know, uh, very chronological. First this happened, then this happened, this happened, this happened. But the interesting thing is to, is to see, I guess, the, the relative value of the places on various parts of this journey. Um, and it's kind of fun sometimes as an individual to, to think, you know, what is my own Eden? Uh, what is my own utopia? You know, and where am I? You know, somewhere. 
somewhere between. I hate to say this, but I think I reached Utopia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave your forwarding address in there. It was interesting when you were mentioning <coughs> your Eden, mm -hmm. um, I, because the first thing I thought of was, I wonder what everybody else's Eden is yeah. like. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, I, and I thought of my own. Yeah. We lived on the Fox River, which was sure. starts out or goes through Marquette uh, or Montello and Marquette County, and, and uh, my folks still live there now. But we'd spend our summers from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. Every day, water ski. We get up and we'd sleep in screen houses that some of the kids had on the river, and they'd have the boats, and we'd go out skiing and we'd walk, ski uptown and stop and walk around. And you never really had a care at all. You didn't. You'd, I were looking, you're trying to impress some people that you wanted to impress, but uh -huh. really had no agenda. You yeah, know, except to just a enjoy word, yeah. yourself. Yeah. And, just uh, be. It seemed like the water for me was one of those things that was always. So I like to go by the river here because of the river. Yeah. I think water has a certain sense yeah. of timelessness about yes. it that can take you to those places yes. again. Yes. But I, it'd be kind of interesting to hear what some other people's Eden were. I, at least that was a thought I had. I don't know whether it was ready to <coughs> tell. Come on, spill <laughs> your guts. <laughs> I think my Eden was in Michigan. My grandparents lived in a little town and had a small resort. And when my grandfather died, we all moved up there. I was in third grade and went to a two-room school house. And it was lovely. We spent the time that we weren't having to be in school. We were out in the woods or down by the lake. And I think, uh, was the best it almost life. has to be associated with childhood, I think. Or something. And sometimes can, that can get protracted. I was talking with a gentleman during break about once in a while you'll run across somebody who's never left Eden, and that makes you uncomfortable because that's not a, a healthy thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of, I, I was thinking specifically of a, a boy I knew in college who never could forget that he'd made an 80-yard run against Wildwood High School mm -hmm. when he was playing football. And he couldn't let go of that. And every time you saw him, he'd want to talk about that. And he dropped out of college and just kind of dissolutely went down the drain. And, and there comes a time, I guess, however inviting, however warm, however nurturing Eden has been, when you've got to leave it, as Muir does, and, and set out on the road for whatever it is that you're trying to do and trying to accomplish whatever agenda to you is your wonderful word. To yeah. I, guess I, it, I guess you can stay. You can tarry over long. You know? I worked with a man who was in the Navy during the Second World War. And that was the highlight of his life. Yeah. No matter what you talked yeah. about, yeah. somehow or the other, the conversation <laughs> I turned around his Navy <laughs> and the Second World War. Yeah, I was in WW2. I was in the big one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah run in the big one. And at one time, the, the big rage in our office was for a room everyone to take a Caribbean cruise. And this man was known as a real tight wad. He wouldn't spend on the hall. And jokingly, one of the girls said, well, Ed, are you going to take a cruise? Well, I spent three years on a cruiser. I know all about that. I don't get to take a cruise. But it, it, was, it was sad, you know, because yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was... I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't begrudge him that experience. It was obviously wonderful, but no. maybe it's time to move on. Yeah. So, and he was not a young man. I think you find that there's a lot of unhappiness in people who can't leave that because they can't look forward. Nothing that they look that looks ahead to them looks good. It's all yes. been done or they've yes. done it, they've seen it, you know, nothing mm -hmm. encouraged them to take the next step. Or if they reach a certain point that they've been looking forward to, then it's like, well what else is there? You know, is that I've all done that. 
Well, what about the person that can't, never had an eat in the first yeah. place? You know, I think of the kid who grows up in the ghetto or whatever, and if this is really part of, <clears throat> or let's just take the, take the, um, just take it as a given that these are things that are normal progression of a person who is going to be a normal individual. If that portion is missing, yeah. then there's going to be a part of that person as an adult that's going to always be not, that's never going to be there and they won't have that to look back to and maybe, I'm just kind of off the top of my head there, that they might have some problems and I think that maybe that, that is a part because there's nothing to look back to. That's well said, yeah. Uh, the Old Testament without, without the early part of Genesis is pretty unremittingly grim, isn't it? A lot of sojourning in the desert there without a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, Um, somebody mentioned earlier, um, in fact, I think it was you that said we should have had a naturalist uh, yeah. Yeah. talk about this. But I was wondering. I I, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. <laughs> I'm wondering, is it important to know, um, you know, what the, what every kind of bird was that he was talking about? Um, well, it's important for some people, and, and, yeah. and I respect that. It was just, I, I was curious. I remember. Um, Oh, page 58. He's naming all these different kinds of birds that were on this farm that they moved to. And I wondered what's, what's happened to them. I guess it goes back maybe to, to 56, 57. I mean, some we still know. The Sandhill Crane, we can go see them uh, easily enough, and, and whippoorwills and so on. But there's Bull bats and night hawks and and do we know those? Sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll See, I'm like getting too city fired now. Yeah. Uh, but I think you don't even you know his talking about the night hawk. You don't have to know exactly what bird it is in the bird book to get a sense of his joy. And uh, I, I guess I was struck with in spite of the hard work and the harshness of his father and so on, mm -hmm. just his his joy and in nature and the world and everything that he came upon and just his joy in being able to wake up at one in the morning and work until sunrise you know yeah. that's not necessary his, his father never broke him did he? Yeah. What, what I found admirable was that it, it seems to be almost a law of nature that if you treat a kid cruelly he's going to treat somebody else cruelly you know, that, 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 mm -hmm. that meanness sort of gets passed on almost has to and, and it seemed to stop it seemed to have been a delightful thing you don't hear much about his mother in this book. No. Uh, but she always a, defended him. Yes, there's a tender scene when he's leaving for Madison, in which he embraces her, and and, and they, they share some tears. And she seems to be, you're right, very quiet, very passive, but nurturing, and doing those things in a mythic sense against the well, he's mother's been do, food. doing something up in his room in one place. He'd been working in his room. His father didn't yes. know about it, and the mother... The mother knew and the kids, but they didn't tell Dad. Yeah, the mothers offer a, a kind of buffer from the excesses of the, of the father. Yeah. But, um, Mears seems to be an observer. I mean, through the whole... It was just amazing to me to think that he had these observations and this memory mm -hmm. from way back when he was a kid, and that he could still remember them well enough to be able to write about them so vividly. and. Um, maybe he didn't need to be um, pass on his physical aggression because he observed it so often with the little boys who were always doing this or that or the other to the wildlife. I don't I don't remember specific passages, but it just seems to me he saw enough violence in nature or with his father or with well, like getting rid of that horse that they loved so well and his dad just gave it away. And there was enough of that maybe that he observed that he didn't need to well, he do it himself? Well, it, it's Scotland, it said, uh, you know, that it was one of the, there's some line about uh, the boys were always fighting because if the parents got to beat them and everything, they at least ought to be able to get the fun of beating each other up, oh. you know, and they'd be in, you know, how many fights a day. And, you know, a lot of times when he's talking about, you know, his tenderness for the animals, like, 
Oh, we so, felt so sorry for the poor cat after we dropped it to the story. <laughs> 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 I mean, and that sort of goes all the way through. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, he's, um, he's a ruffian. Talking boy, about scoochers and all that, or what was that in the very beginning? Talking about they how they the they hang dormer. from the yes. yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. It was like his aggression was coming out in a different way. He didn't beat people, but he came out with this ag real aggression um, in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think he recognized that as part of you know when you're talking about all the section where he's talking about all the animals who are frozen and so yeah. on. I think he recognized that's a part of nature. Nature is beautiful. It's lilies on a lake. And it's also difficult. It's it's there. There's some line in here about the way the forest is pruned by life, many and, and all this is part of the cycle. And I think that's important. And I think it is get a sense of the wholeness of it all too, not just not just the beautiful aspects. Of how it all work together. But it bird was that that they caught. And then they made a big deal of looking at the feathers and so um, maybe, maybe it was wood duck. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, his father shot the wood duck. And okay. Said, yeah. yeah. Beautiful creature got his name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This wood duck egg was different than my wood duck that I had out in my yard up here on the river. Uh, that was way high up in a tree too, but the little ones didn't get carried down to the river. The day came and I just had to be looking out the window when they did it. They stood on the edge of the hole, jumped out, rolled down the bank, and walked off and swam into the river. Mm. Mm. Didn't seem to hurt them a bit, mm. falling all that distance, 15, 20 feet up in the tree. Mm. That was one of the highlights of my life. Yeah, just <laughs> catch that at the right time. Mm. Right place at the right time. I think the loon was where they. He had oh, got the loon out of the water that was freezing around it and brought it into the house and set it in front of the fireplace and then the cat came that over was the and most was hilarious. Wasn't that Antic funny? Cat, wasn't it? Oh, I could just see that cat getting pecked on top of the head. <laughs> <laughs> Keep looking at that loon. <laughs> There's some other bird that you tried to thaw and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Chunk that up. Oh, he's yeah. increasing knowledge. Was that it? Could have been a skunk cat. Could have been some animal. Yeah, yeah. That's what um, I think of. Yeah, yeah. 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 he thought maybe it'd be like a fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, how has reading this um, changed or altered your perception? of rural living, <coughs> even small town living, yeah. the access to the uh, rural country that we have here. I decided that they had had a very hard life, but I was glad I wasn't living in those days. Mm -hmm. It was okay. interesting to me because his father sounds like my grandfather, my father's father, who was very strict, cruel man, I guess. And when my dad was only you know, seven or so, they homesteaded way up north, North Dakota. And he told stories of the hardship that were some of the things that John Hoover tells him here. And so it was. I just felt a great empathy with them because mm -hmm. I could appreciate some of the hardships and, and the way they live. Mm -hmm. Some of the stories, you know, just amazing that people did those kind of things. <coughs> they were so spoiled, our lives were so soft, and you just think back to these people, and it always amazes me that they got in their covered wagons and took off to the west and did all these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that brings up a point, you know, the, the harshness, because I remember <clears throat> no, my grandfather wouldn't go back uh, nearly as, or as far as uh, John Muir, but my mother, I can always remember saying how hard he was on the children, and 
it seems like Muir and when we read about some of the other people, um, the other term, they're they're really much more the exception. Well, obviously they're the exception because they get into, you know they're, they they get into books and they do these great things. <clears throat> but I think in general the their attitude is an exception also, because if you look at the general populace, you probably found a very hard, hardy, and harsh people coming out of the environment that they had at that particular time. You know? I think <clears throat> probably if you did a case study of someone in the uh, X amount of individuals or grandparents or whatever, you'd find some of them being not all that kind and they are out working in the fields and they were living in a pretty rough life most of the time. I think Mira was probably, uh, seems to me like he'd be an exception. He was exceptional in the name that he was able to have the attitude that he had with that bringing up. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. I can remember even when I was little, one of our neighbors was so terribly cruel to his children and his animals that when he walked in the barn, the, the animals all just quivered. And his horses, the minute that he'd drop his reins, his rain, <coughs> they would run away. Uh, it's sort of a matter of survival. Yes, and so many people, a lot of people had <coughs> large, and raised large families. They raised their kids to work. That's why they had all these kids. They had to have help on the farms. Yeah. It seemed, though, from John Muir that uh, yeah, the father was harsher than he, he had to be, or Muir thought he had to be. Mm -hmm. Muir compared his, his father and the other Scotsmen and people mm -hmm. who came over from the old country with the Yankees who took time off in the fishing season to go mm -hmm. fishing and, mm -hmm. and you know, just took a much more easy approach to life and, and seemed mm -hmm. to survive uh, just as well. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if uh, you know, they... Uh, they were intentionally harsh mm -hmm. on themselves. Uh, instead of using the, the good firewood to the right. mm -hmm. lumber they had chopped down for firewood to keep them warm in the winter, they'd haul it all off to, to build these uh, fences and get it out of the way and shiver in the winter time. They yeah. couldn't even light a fire to warm up their frozen socks. So mm -hmm. they put their frozen socks on to go out to work. I <laughs> lived <laughs> in the country where we use wood all the time. You know, we heat it with wood. But that was that was so different because we always had lots of heat. <laughs> when you commented a while back, you know, about uh, his walking to Madison and how far it was, and everything, it brought back memories of my grandfather. I lived in Racine, and he he homesteaded. Well, if anybody knows Racine, it's right where the Johnson Wax uh, uh, new stuff is there. Uh, that's where he uh, built his home. And he was a teamster for J.I. Case and worked six days a week for them. And on S Sunday, his recreation was to walk from home to South Walk and back again. Yeah, not my idea, but he did that every week. I was interested in the part about the. Uh, uh, passenger pigeons mm -hmm. because uh, I had heard Dora's or not Dora, Helene's mother-in-law tell about the uh, passenger pigeons and my father would be over a hundred years old where he lived and they told about how they would kill those passenger pigeons you know just beat them with a stem, and then they would just cut out the breast pack those in box bring them into the house, pack them in <coughs> boxes and they shipped them to the city yeah. The last one died in the St. Louis Zoo a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether my father ever saw that or not, but I've heard he, he told about that, and, and Mama Reynolds used to tell that too. Huh. Yeah, they used to roost up on the cliffs and <coughs> to up by Boston, I guess, up in that area. Just thousands of them, I guess. They would just come through like like locusts, and when they went through the field, there was no green left. Well, that's one reason why the farmers killed them, I suppose. If you ever get to um, Green Bay, the, the museum in Green Bay has a display, and they, there's a sound. Uh, when you walk in, it sets off an automatic trigger that starts this recording of the passenger pigeons, and you're standing there, and they have a few um, mo like mobiles hanging above you and then the sound comes on and it's just 
overwhelming. Really quite a spectacular display. Um, we just mentioned a little bit about some of the people that Muir met. And uh, well, I think it's kind of fascinating that, that so many of these people that were contemporaries and, and grew up. And I was just wondering um, what your feeling was about uh, Muir's influence on his contemporaries. I guess the, the one that comes to my mind is Teddy Roosevelt. He camped with Teddy Roosevelt. And um, because of that, uh, influence when Roosevelt became president then many of those acres were put aside for national national parks. We met Emerson and some of those other quite note noteworthy people. Well, that's my feeling and I just think he um, he had a, a quite a bit of effect it seems with the people that people of the day, important people of the day that, uh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can be thankful that they did listen to him and that he did have that vision. Did he ever settle down or did he wander? He married. Mm -hmm. uh, his yes. wife preceded him in death, but after he left Wisconsin, he became primarily associated with the state of California spent most of his time there. He did a good deal of wandering and so on, but once married seemed more or less to you. I mean, uh, it, it's pointed out in the, in, in the introduction of this book that there were a couple of times in his life when he was close to being financially independent and uh, um, either something would happen on board mm -hmm. or by his own volition he would run away <coughs> from that security. Then that, that uh, nine to five trap and uh, <laughs> um, and came very strike close, out for the wilderness. He came very close to losing his eyesight, yes. Yes. becoming yes. blind, and that yes. was the thing that really set him. It was yeah. um, some kind of a factory, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Um, wagon factory in yeah. Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Wagon wheel factory. And then he decided that he should study the inventions of God instead of. Other, he should give up on his own inventions. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great. After his marriage in 1880, Muir settled down as a California fruit raiser. He so prospered that he released himself from the bondage of money making. Uh, but that's rather late in his life. In his, what, 50s? I don't know. When was he born? I had it. 18. <coughs> On the back cover, I think. On the back cover? Okay. 1849, he comes to Wisconsin, but that was, uh, it was what, 14 then? 11. 11. Yeah, so he was born around uh, uh, 38. Mm -hmm. Here, April 21st, 1838 to December 24th, 1914. So, if he doesn't uh, settle down until 1880, uh, <laughs> he's uh, in his 40s or 50s before he... He's get, married in 1880. Get, ...gets domesticated at all. Did he ever meet uh, Aldo Leopold? Did he ever cross paths? I, I think they're... I don't think they're, yeah, I don't think they're contemporaries. But it was like Thoreau and Emerson and, um, and Roosevelt. Those are the three names that come to my mind. Because Leopold died, I think, in 48, so they were just... They would have been alive when <coughs> he was alive, but when he mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, but... By the way, he's but a child. Would have been like me meeting your son. <laughs> you have no recollection of it ever. <laughs> Well, you never know. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> at least at this point. <laughs> Thoughts of book discussions. Always in the back of the TV. <laughs> 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 it's amazing how many different places he wandered to, though. Because 
you can go from here out west and every once in a while you'll find something with John Muir's name on it. Not Somewhere just this country. Out of the way place. New Zealand, Australia. I've never been to Russia. I've looked at it. I know, but it's <laughs> astonishing. Places that he visited, you mean? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. There must have been something very special about him. Magnetic, charming, I don't know what word you use, because it seems as though when he'd meet people, they would immediately be nice to him. Was he, did they sense a sadness or something? Oh, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Love laughing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well said. Because if, if, when you read about all these people at home, they were all just really nice to him. You don't find that many people who are really <laughs> nice to you all the time. Well, maybe he had such a rough, hard life and harsh life at home that uh, when someone was halfway civil to him, he thought they were being real nice. You <laughs> That's know? true. That could That's be true. If you've been beaten all your life, mm -hmm. and somebody doesn't beat you, they're nice to you. That's true. <laughs> but he certainly was um, uh, oh, what not, not charming, but um, in the very beginning of his life, talking about his brother and and the games that they played, um, it seemed as if there was a real love for life, like we've already talked about, that uh, never left him. And that that <coughs> comes out of a person, and um, maybe they, um, that personality plus the machines he made um, yes. got him in. I just love that passage about uh, the Partyville, um, when he was taking the train from Partyville yes. to Madison, <laughs> I'm from Rio. So to <laughs> think about, I probably know the grandchildren of these people <laughs> and the bar that they all came out of. <laughs> I think it's the machine to bone fish. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had that boy's head. I'd rather have that boy's head than the best farm in this country. Maybe some of the harshness where you had to put everything to memory, so many different and varied things, help him in the future then, you know, especially with as hard as it was, to be able to remember some of these things and particular things that happened in his childhood. He had a trained memory. Yeah, exactly I think sometimes if you, uh, if you study the lives of people who really achieve something in this life, <laughs> You begin to suspect that maybe the worst thing you can do for your kids is give them a happy child, mm -hmm. a well-developed So many, and that seems true of so many people who are exceptionally gifted and, uh, and who achieve with the deals. Almost universal. Tough time. They've had, they've had to work for everything that they've got. And we really aren't doing our kids a favor by handling them everything on a silver platter. But you know, uh, that, that, goes, that goes against, and you mentioned it earlier, Bill, about the, uh, it goes against modern day psychology that you will be having the exact opposite result if you treat, if the child is beaten as a youngster, he will then, so on, if the child is sexually abused by a parent, he will do the same. You know, and statistically, I think those things are borne out, but these people somehow seem to rise above that yes. situation. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, yeah. and, and so, I, I, I wouldn't agree that we should handle No, no, no. no. I, I know you're not saying that. kids around no. in hopes that they will turn out better people. <laughs> right. but, uh, but perhaps that, that need, uh, excuse me here, that's that need for struggle in, in one's life is important, at least sometime to encounter it, because if you don't if you don't ever struggle and you haven't had it, um, it seems like you don't appreciate what's around you, and, and I think that's perhaps, uh, and you don't need to be sexually abused or something like that, but I, I, I think perhaps that's something, it's easy for me to say because I don't have kids, but it's something that you notice with kids who grow up with everything supplied to them and no struggle, that they, when they become adults, they have got trouble because all of a sudden they're out in a world where they're on their own and they never seem to actually get on their own because they have never struggled and it's not The highlight of their life is a football game when they touch them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it's been interesting moving to a small town, and I've always lived in a big city, but um, on that thing about the, the 80 yard touchdown run or whatever, it's interesting to come into a small town, and I've moved several times in my life, so I don't have a sense of place, and hopefully that's developing, but um, it's interesting to see how that perpetuates itself from generation to generation, and the adults who were doing it when they were in high school, and that was the the glorious moments of their lives were in high school. Now they're back at high school um, with their children and, and pushing those kids to do those same things. And yes. it's uh, kind of interesting to observe that. And I don't mean that offensively to anybody, but it's interesting to see the kids who, uh, or the people that grew up in the Dells and how they perpetuate that in, in their children and, and how important it is to the adults to see their kids do that. And it's. Um, and again, I wasn't one of those people in high school that would, high school was not glorious. No, no. <laughs> but, but it is interesting to see how they perpetuated with their children and, and how in those adults it's still the biggest thing happening on Friday night. And um, don't get me wrong, I'm a big football fan, but um, it, it is interesting to see it in a small town and to see that close circle and that happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting and unfortunate. <laughs> to an extent. Interesting and, and unfortunate to an extent. I but, think. you know, also fortunate from another side. Um, because there is, you know, I mean, there are two sides to that. But in a, in a city, um, well, my brother and I were talking last weekend about um, giving something back to your community. And we grew up in a big city, and there was no feeling of that. And it's interesting to see that in a small town, how people see that need to give it back. And, to be part of the community. I grew up with no sense of that at all. Yeah. Well, you, can, you can almost see it, almost an immediate or direct relationship when you do something that sparks an interest or uh, there's an almost an immediate feedback, I think, in a smaller town. You know, in a larger town, it might take you know, a couple neighborhoods <laughs> away before they, you know, somebody responds positively to what you're doing. That's just um, something I felt about a small town. <coughs> the other thing I thought was kind of interesting, um, which goes way off the subject, but Professor Sterling was the man that uh, introduced or actually presented a, a utopia to John Muir. <coughs> And wasn't it Sterling Hall that was bombed by another group of people Utopias. who yeah. were looking for another yeah. utopia? Yeah. Utopia's got a bad reputation in the 20th century. Orwell's <laughs> 1985, mm -hmm. and Thomas Huxley's Brave New World, and so on. You're in the wake of uh, Hitler and Stalin, kind of deeply suspicious at this particular time as to about the utopian vision, mm -hmm. uh, because so much mischief has been done in its name. But, uh, mm -hmm. Well, the other thought I had on the utopia as we were talking about it was um, wh whose utopia was this that was pre pre that John Muir presented? Was it his in, in his growing up years, or was it his father's? You know, if this was his utopia, I think it would be different. But well, utopia, of course, is something that you achieve, that you earn. I, mm. I, 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 I think Muir had a vision of utopia in America, which for him included such things as wilderness areas preserved as wilderness, and, and national forests, and national parks, and a new respect for the environment, and for what we would call in our own time ecological concerns. Wildlife, uh, and and he set about doing what he could to bring that vision into, into reality. 